Okay, so this is the question. Um, as you are doing geometric optics, you'll find that a lot of the questions are geometric questions. So uh, this is one of those questions where you have to work through some geometry. Um, probably not the hardest geometry. There are prisms where, you, um, at least I found, I need to draw more auxiliary figures. But um, that's kind of most of what I do when I have to work through some geometry, kind of extend some lines, uh, label some angles, kind of stare at it until something comes. <laughs> comes. That's a, one of the reasons I find it somewhat challenging to uh, teach geometry because it's often either you see the solution or you don't. Um, so while we are working through geometric optics, we're going to see quite a bit of that. So... I would just ask for your patience and um, and the persistence as you work through them. So this question says, it says a light is entering on optical fiber. And I think we are modeling that optical fiber kind of a, as a rectangular thing. You can imagine a cross-sectional view uh, surrounded by air. Um, so this uh, index of refraction outside the fiber should be one. It's first refracted, right? Refracted here and then reflected as shown below. Okay. Um, part A asks, what is the minimum angle theta one at which an instant ray will still be totally internally reflected? Oh, yeah, this is a trick question. <laughs> so um, I hope you remember the total internal reflection from lecture. Uh, just a quick recap of total internal reflection. This is one of those things that I don't really memorize the formulas for because um, once I once you understand the scenario where this happens, then it's uh, um, kind of relatively quick to drive the formulas. So imagine you have a, kind of the medium, and uh, this is my N2. And the important thing here is that index of refraction here is greater than the index of refraction outside. And you need a kind of scenario where light is incident from a point, uh, direction that has greater index of refraction. And you are looking for a scenario where there is no possible way for this light to refract through. And when that happens because of conservation of energy, the energy that's incident that cannot refract through has to go somewhere and it gets all gets all reflected. And the kind of the threshold uh, situation is where this is coming in at just uh, such an angle that the refracted angle, if one existed, would be 90 degrees. Um, so that scenario is where you have the critical angle and you would have this kind of totally reflected uh, internally thing. <laughs> so, Picturing this scenario, you can write down the Snell's law equation that says, okay, instant side and two sine theta critical is going to be equal to the outgoing side term, which is the index of refraction in this scenario, just the one, but it can be any index of refraction that's less than N2, uh, times sine of this uh, refracted angle, which is 90 degrees, sine of 90 degrees is one, so one. So you can solve for critical angle here and get arc sine of, um, in this scenario, one over N2. But more generally, this one could be the index of refraction of the outgoing side. So, so that's a, this is a formula that we are going to be using at some point. Now, as you read the question A, as you imagine, um, so, you know, in this scenario, Imagine moving this beam either this way or this way. And think about moving the beam which way will mess up the total internal reflection. So if you move the beam this way, you are reducing the incident angle. So you will be reducing the, uh, the outgoing refracted angle. So if you move the beam this way, you might um, what used to be totally internally reflected might not happen that way anymore. So, okay, so reducing the angle of incidence that could mess up some things. Now, imagine moving this to the even greater angle, greater angle of incidence, or kind of the shallower, more grazing kind of incidence. 
then um, then it's still going to totally internally reflect. This is the outgoing ray. If uh, there was one, it would even be greater than 90 degrees, and that just doesn't happen. That's sort of why total internal reflection happens. So as you make the angle of incidence uh, shallower, you will be fine as far as the total internal reflection goes. So as you look at this picture, I hope you have this intuition. As you make the theta one, this angle, smaller and smaller, um, this outgoing angle, theta two, it becomes a shallower and shallower. So it, as far as the total internal reflection goes, it's just gonna make things better. So if your incident angle was uh, zero degrees, then that'll be fine. <laughs> and it says only enter values of zero or greater. So I'm just gonna enter zero. It's kind of a trick question. Um, it, because if you're just trying to plug numbers into formula, then maybe you won't get it. Uh, but if you're thinking through the scenario, if you understood uh, what's involved in total internal reflection, and you, you are just thinking, um, have a mental image of the geometry that you are working through, then this, you should be able to arrive at this answer. And part to be is a more um, real question, where it's asking, what is the maximum angle theta 1? that's uh, smaller than 90 degree, at which an instant ray will still be totally internally reflected. Okay, that's an interesting question. So I think I can imagine if I'm, yeah, I guess I can imagine if I'm coming in at something like this, barely 90 degrees, then this might refract at an angle where it'll still refract through. I guess that's a possibility. So I'm now going to try to set up this picture. So I'm looking for the maximum angle here, which means I'm looking for kind of the maximum angle here as well. And my theta three here will become, this will be my critical angle. So uh, for figuring out this theta three, I can use this uh, expression for total internal reflection. I can say my theta three uh, for part B should be arc sine of one over N two. Okay. Um, and if uh, the question was asking for theta three, we would uh, enter that and we'd be done. <laughs> but it's not asking for that. Um, it's asking for angle on theta one. So we need to figure out some way to relate this angle theta three to theta one. And um, if we somehow knew theta two, then we can relate that to theta one through Snell's law. So our goal now is to figure out the relationship between theta three and theta two. And I guess I'll mention this at some point. There's a, something I like to call uh, general physics problem solving strategy, which is to kind of try to split your problem solving into two stages. The first stage, you are trying to come up with a system of equations in which you have enough information to completely solve your system. And then once you have that, then you um, uh, then you um, uh, then you then you do the algebra <laughs> to solve it, um, and I guess I can. Uh, this is kind of a simple enough question where you don't have to do that, but I think I can cast it that way. So in this question right now, we have really um, we have two unknowns. We don't know theta one, and we are looking for theta one, so it's an unknown. And we also don't know theta three. I mean, we can find it, but until we do this equation thing, we don't know theta three. So we have two unknowns so far that we are concerned with. And so far we have one equation. And this is something I think you learned in college algebra, where um, in given a system of independent, uh, independent system of equations, you need as many equations as unknowns to solve it completely. So I have two unknowns, one equation. I don't have enough to uh, enough equations to be able to solve this system. So you might say, well, I know this the Snell's law thing. So let me just write down the Snell's law equation here. So the out the incident side n one or one times sine of theta one is equal to um, the outgoing side n two times the sine of theta two. This is my 
second equation. And this is, by the way, what I'm calling information. In physics problem solving, your information will come in a form of an equation. It might be an equation that looks like this, where it's already solved for something. <laughs> That's kind of the formula where you plug in numbers. Or it might be an equation like this that you write down from a law, like a Snell's law. But in the most general form, the information in physics problem solving comes as equations. And, um, and at this stage of the problem solving, I would uh, not focus on solving them for anything particular like this, unless they already came that way. So, okay, you might think we have two equations, two unknowns, you can solve it, but that would be too hasty because in writing down second equation, we had to introduce a new unknown, theta two. So we have two equations, but we now have three unknowns. So we are not quite there yet. And the main goal of this uh, problem, this step of problem solving strategy is to be at a place where you are writing, we are writing down an equation and you are introducing few enough of unknowns that you reach that equilibrium or the point where your number of equations is equal to the number of unknowns. So you're staring at this and really the only way to uh, introduce additional bit of information that won't introduce any more unknowns is to use the geometry. There is some geometric relationship between theta two and theta three. And you might see it most easily if you do what I recommend, you know, start just drawing auxiliary figures, extend the lines, um, kind of spot the triangles you see, and I think it's a right triangle because yeah, this has to be like a right angle and this is gonna be a right angle, right? So this is a right triangle. I have something that relates the internal angles of right triangle. So let me write that down. Um, theta two plus theta three plus the third angle, 90 degrees, they should add up to 180 degrees. Hopefully that's a, some error in your geometry knowledge. It's a, this is a, one of the things that makes a geometry challenging as well. There are all these theorems and stuff that you learned that you kind of have to remember <laughs> if you don't remember it. I ask for your patience and perseverance as you work through this geometric optics. So oh, why did I write two? So we have now third equation and let's just double check to make sure that I didn't introduce any new unknowns. So as I'm looking at here, you know, theta three, I counted. And two is going to be a known quantity. I think, uh, um, oh, they say crown glass. And I think N2, I can look it up somewhere. Um, in equation two, I have theta one, second unknown, and two, something I can look up. And theta two, that was third unknown. Okay, and as I look at my third equation, nothing more unknown here. So now I finally have three equations, three unknowns. I should be able to solve this system of equations for this uh, one unknown that I care about. And uh, let me do this by hand. And when you do this algebra by hand, um, you really want to be deliberate. As in, uh, and this is the kind of things that you do want to take into account. So the quantity that you want in the end, that ought to be the very last thing you solve for. because. Um, the kind of the algebra strategy that I really recommend is the substitution. Using substitution, you can eliminate the unknowns that you don't want in your system of equations. So for example, so I'm looking to eliminate either theta two or theta three. Um, I think I can use equation three to eliminate theta two here. So let me do that. So I'm gonna solve this equation three for theta two is equal to uh, 90 degrees, move that over, cancel, so 90 degrees, minus theta three. I can plug this in here to get a new equation two prime, that's going to say sine of theta one is equal to n two times, and this is a sine of 90 degrees, plugging in the expression for theta two there. 90 degrees minus theta three. And I think I can do the rest numerically. So, so this is what I see now. I have this expression, which expresses theta one in terms of everything else and of theta three. 
And I do have this equation that I can plug it in here. So if I really wanted to, really wanted to simplify, I can write this down. Let me skip us or, or let me do this. Sine theta one is equal to and two times the sine of 90 degree minus and this expression for theta three, eliminating it, uh, arc sine of one over n two. And I can actually solve for theta one here. I think a theta one is going to be an acute angle, angle in the first quadrant. In that case, I can just use arc sine of the whole thing. Arc sine cancels the sine and gives me just theta one on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, it'll be arc sine of n two times the sine of, and you know, it, this is not a simple expression. Like if I was looking for an analytical expression, I would maybe try to simplify this more. But it's a simple in the sense that everything on the right hand side, I can actually just plug in numbers. For. If I have a number for n2, I can plug it in to get arc sine of one over n2. I get on some kind of angle, subtract that from 90, get a sine, and then multiply by n2, and then get an arc sine. So let me actually do that. Um, I think a crown glass has um, index or refraction close enough to 1.5. So let me just try that. And if I get a wrong answer, then I'll just look it up. <laughs> so I can just go through this calculation I was describing. 1 divided by 1.5. It's 1 over n2. Put it through arc sine or inverse sine. Uh, that's my angle in degrees. Let me store that into memory and 90 degrees minus memory recall. That's the angle that will go inside the sign. So let me put it through sign, multiply that by uh, 1.5, get 1.118. Oh, did I mess up something? Um, oh. <laughs> So the answer, okay, so if you are putting this through a calculator, you'll get this answer, you know, you do arc sine and you can invalid the input. And um, what it is, is the uh, index of the index of refraction of crown glass is high enough that this can go all the way up to 90 degrees and it'll be fine. So it's kind of a trick question that way. <laughs> so part A and B, you can answer super quickly. Um, part B, especially if you just check some numbers, you can answer super quickly. Um, now, all this work wasn't for nothing. That's really what for what part C is for. And I think for that, um, I did some extra work that's gonna be wasted. Uh, but I think I can still, um, Preserve it a little bit. So, okay, this is what I can do. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I can take this expression and this expression contains two symbols. Before I was treating n2 as known and theta one as unknown that I'm gonna solve for. Okay, I'm gonna flip them around. Theta one is, n2 is now the value I'm trying to solve for. And theta one is the uh, the known quantity. And you have to kind of read through the question and think through before you figure out what the value of theta one here should be. Saying, you know, to ensure that all instant rays are totally internally reflected. So the worst scenario is where this is coming in at 90 degrees. So we, let's say theta one is 90 degrees and we work from there. Uh, so imagine taking sine of both sides, then this left hand side is going to be one, and the right hand side will be this expression here. So let me write that out. We have one is equal to n2 sine of 90 degrees minus arc sine of one over n2. And okay, so this is the extra work I have to do. I have to work through the algebra to just to solve for that n2. And I think I can do this divide both sides by n2 so i have sine and so i can put both sides through arc sine then i'll get this for left hand side the sine will get peeled away so i'll have this for the right hand side and oh and i think i can solve for um i got lucky in that i have this arc sine of one over n2 
and arcsine of 1 over n2, I can collect like terms. Um, I can move this over here, get uh, 2 times arcsine of 1 over n2, get rid of that. That's going to be equal to 90 degrees, or um, arcsine of, let me write this up, arcsine of 1 over n2 is equal to 45 degrees. So take a sign of the whole thing and then take the reciprocal <laughs> that will give you n2 is equal to 1 over sine of 45 degrees. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely did more calculation than I had to. All right, let me just do this now. Um, so 1 divided by 45 degrees. Uh, put it through. I mean, you know, it's going to be a uh, root. 2 over root 2, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me do. Is that right? Anyways, 1.414. So that you actually need to do the math for. 1.414. And so this is what I want you to demonstrate, by the way. So uh, let me enter these answers here. So 0, 90, 1.414 and when you submit an end um it'll you know end your attempt and you might see the score i don't think uh, and um uh, uh let's imagine that you forgot to attach work here I, my recommendation is to you know, attach it here but let's say you had uh, forgotten you can actually come back and um reattach the you know edit your work and um th that is really a required part for you to get full credit on this problem set assessment. And you can attach work in many different ways. You can type it. You can attach a file or a picture. Let me do the picture thing. I think that's the kind of easiest thing for me to do. I can take a screenshot here of through here. And I do recommend that you organize your work a bit, you know, make sure someone other than you looking at it can understand what it is you are saying. Um, and, but I think this is kind of organized well enough. Let me see. So yeah, I did include the A, I need to include the B. Um, so problem set assessments are graded manually. As I grade through it, I will look for these attached works. And if I don't see any, uh, I am going to be taking points off. <laughs> so please make sure you do attach work. Um, if for problem set one assessment, if you haven't attached work, you can actually go back and attach work and you shouldn't need to use any lay pass to do that. So um, and the system kind of timestamps when you attach the work. As long as you attach your work before I've graded it, I'm, I, I don't care when you attached it, as long as it was there before I graded it. So, so yeah, this is kind of what you need. And um, um, with the problems at one, as I was saying, because of that little hiccup with the myop math we had this morning, I'll make the feedback available to you in a different way than my normal way. Um, Next to with the starting with the problems at two assessment, I will demonstrate how you can access the feedback. Uh, I guess the short answer is you access your feedback on this screen. It's a question of getting to this screen. Uh, the, there should be after I'm done grading, there should be feedback somewhere here, probably below here. 